You're listening to Reach Teach Talk with Nat Dane. Welcome back to another episode of Reach, Teach, Talk. There's a lot of focus on the power of words. We just had a few episodes ago, Dr. Drew Kugler speak about the power of words and how important uh, conversation is and words play a major part in communication. Today, we're going to invert it and we're going to talk about the hidden power of listening and how it's some many, many, many cases, the words left unsaid or the restraining oneself from speaking and from filling space and the idea instead of trusting in the quiet and understanding that with quiet can be a lot of activity. So we're going to talk today about listening, about active listening, about the idea of of how we can communicate uh, whether it's in our classroom, whether it's within our organization, whether it's with our neighbors, whether it's with somebody in need, how we can use the power and trust in the power of listening in conversation. So today I'm really thrilled because we have an expert on listening. He is a listening educator and a professor at the School of Journalism and New Media at University of Mississippi. This is Dr. Graham Bodie, who is also, he's the chief listening officer for an organization called Listen First, which we're going to delve into a little bit later in this episode. But I'm honored, Graham, to have you here with us today because I've read some of your research, I've read some of your papers, I've seen some of your lectures up on your website, and I'm really keen on just having some time to spend with you where I can listen, and you can share about why listening and listening well matters and helps facilitate conversation. We are in a day and age where we are not seeing fantastic examples of listening. Um, we, we might be seeing a lot of words and hearing a lot of communication you know, being blasted at us from all sorts of leaders, um, but we don't necessarily see active, good listening. So to, you know, to have you, Graham, as a guest today to help us break down what active listening is and how important it is and what it can do to help um, in learning and education, is going to be just an absolutely fantastic opportunity. So, Dr. Bodie, just welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Nat. It's just it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Well, I'm thrilled to have you with us. And I think my first question actually is just basically, how does one get to be, how do you find yourself in the seat of chief listening officer? I listen first. How did you find yourself as a professor and, and, and a listening educator um, and with a focus on listening? Is there a story to this? That's a, that's a good question. I think, you know, um, m- much like other, some other fields, um, you know, you could call yourself a listening expert, just, you know, just call yourself that. Um, there, there isn't necessarily a, you know, a, a, a social work certification, you know, or, um, you know, a psychology certification, although I did go to school specifically for communication studies. So I do have credentials. Um, and, and so I, I went to school um, for uh, communication studies as an undergraduate. Uh, and felt like I needed a couple more semesters of school, so continued with graduate work. And, and in that process, during my master's program, um, I was introduced to this organization called the International Listening Association. It's an academic association um, devoted to the research teaching of, of listening, and um, happened to be um, sort of uh, uh, one of my mentors was a past president of that organization uh, and got into the literature and just sort of found a niche for um, how I could study um, some some what everybody considers important, but but oftentimes doesn't get a lot of uh, a lot of due attention in the academic literature. And then went on to get a PhD at Purdue with uh, one of the leading scholars in supportive communication. Uh, so focused my studies on listening in the context of how we often don't show up properly for our closest um, relatives, friends, marital partners, and so forth, and children inside of close personal relationships and, and, and what the power of listening when someone's stressed uh, can be outside of the context of psychotherapy or a therapeutic relationship. Uh, what are some of the principles that we learn in the therapeutic context that may or may not be applicable for everyday stressors? And so my scholarship is focused over the last 20 years on uh, everyday stressors, particularly in the context of close personal relationships. And so my journey is, is one of, uh, in the academy definitely not the only journey that someone could could take to to be a, an expert 
in the study of listening, but that that's my journey. I love that you, uh, many things I love that you, what you just said, but I'm thinking about your, your um, it's kind of hope filled message that anybody can learn. It seems like anybody can learn to be a good listener. And this is not about teaching, um, you know, kind of counseling skills or psycho, you know, kind of any sort of psychology based um, skills. It's more actually that everybody in everyday life can learn how to be a better listener. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think there are some principles and practices from various disciplines, whether it's social work or psychology or, or, or you know, in any branches of, of psychotherapy that are useful for us to, to know about and to consider and to study. Um, but as you as you suggest, I, it is a skill. Um, it, it is a skill that we can learn. Um, it's not something we're born doing well. Uh, listening is um, the way that we listen is actually habitual as opposed to temperamental. So we're not born with some sort of predisposition to listen in a particular way. Rather, we're socialized over the course of our lives from, you know, from the cradle to the grave to, to listen and, and have certain habits and biases of listening that pre, predispose us to do certain things that are sort of, you know, considered, you know, good listening, you know, uh, and other things that may not be considered, you know, good listening. Some things that might um, sort of, uh, you know, take us down a wrong trajectory when we're listening to somebody, some, some bad habits, if you will. Um, so very much like other communication skills, listening is one of those things that, um, you know, uh, we, we don't do well all of the time. And sometimes it's dependent on the person we're talking to. So some people like to be listened to in certain ways and other people prefer, you know, to be listened to in other ways. And so it's one of those skills that takes practice. Um, and so it is a skill, but it's also a practice. It's something that you have to do uh, continually and help and, and, and try to improve on right almost daily in order to do it well. You know, that ties into something you mentioned earlier about uh, showing up and how there's a connection between how you show up and how well you listen, it sounds, right? It's, it's, and and that, that is the conditioning part, it sounds like. It's how you prepare yourself, how you enter a conversation, how you show up. Is there anything you can share more about the idea of showing up and that connection to listening? Yeah, it's interesting. So we have phrases in our um, English vernacular that so this goes something like, you know, think before you speak, but there isn't the equivalent think before you listen. And, and so why is that, right? Why don't we put as much attention on thinking before we listen, preparing ourselves before we go into a conversation, uh, primarily as a listener? There's a, there's a whole line of ph philosophical um, research, literature, and writings that um, several contemporary scholars have um, brought to bear um, uh, to talk about listening as a way of being. Um, it's, it's, an, it's an ontology. It's a way of existing. Uh, Liz, Liz Lapari at Denison University calls it uh, the listening being. In, in other words, to, to, to be a listener is to be uh, as, as a certain type of, of person with a certain type of mindset, if you will, to kind of westernize that notion of being in presence. Um, and, and so it's tied a lot to notions of mindfulness that, of course, have been, you know, um, sort of, you know, um, taken from Eastern traditions and Westernized and all these sort of things. Um, so there's various branches of mindfulness and there's various ways that you might consider being mindful and showing up and being present. Um, but one of the core attributes uh, associated with good listening is, in fact, um, presence, is, in fact, being there. Um, so not quite a hundred percent a synonym, but very a close, um, um, you know, term to listening or paying attention is this notion of being there or being present, which a lot of times is, um, is enough, uh, at least at the initial stages, particularly for very traumatic forms of, of grief or other kinds of, of events in your life that no amount of talk will change. No amount of, you know, saying the right words or sort of, you know, filling your hypodermic needle with the right things and, you know, trying to inject in the other person. So um, I, I do think in our culture, uh, we tend to prioritize speaking and we tend to, to, to think about strategies for speaking well, and we tend to downplay or even ignore and not even pay attention to the fact that we ought to have the same sort of level of attention in terms of pre-listening. What are we doing before we show up as a listener to get ourselves ready to be in that mode of, uh, of activity. Wow. That focus on how we prepare ourselves before we listen and how listening can be enough. It just, wow. We've all been in situations where, you know, we've had something happen to us and 
you just watch your friends struggle to find the right words, right? I just can't find the right words, but I want to be. You don't know what to say, right? Yeah, yeah t- I don't know what to say. Tell me what to say. Um, where really it's the mere act of being there and being present, as you said. Um, which is enough. And it's in a sense, and, and, and it's funny because the beginning I was saying, we, we were talking about how it's not about psychology, but there is something about removing of the ego, I would imagine, yeah. in, in listening, right? Training yourself to, um, if you can best as possible, not to think about how you as a listener are coming across, but to really open yourself up as a vessel to, to truly and unequivocally and unconditionally listening. Um, is, is there anything more you can say to that? Yeah. Removing yourself, removing your agenda. I mean, you know, thinking that it's not about you. Um, this conversation isn't all about you, uh, taking responsibility as a conversational partner for at least half, if not a hundred percent of the way that that conversation goes, the trajectory of that conversation. There's some pretty good research that shows the way in which, um, a, a listener, um, if you, you know, it's, it's hard to, to separate, like there's a speaker and a listener and they're playing these different roles in a conversation. But if, but if you think about something in terms of like, um, uh, a personal story, um, so Jan Babalus, um, who's at, um, in Victoria, British Columbia, um, has this paradigm where she brings people in the lab and she has them tell a, what she calls a close call story, which is a, a story where something sort of almost happened or some surprising or frightening thing happened and, and it was a close call and, and so and, 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 it, and it turned out okay right so one of the stories, few yeah ooh, right <laughs> uh, so one of the stories is you know this woman is reading in bed at night and she has one of those lamps uh, you know clamped to her headboard she falls asleep and the lamp falls on the pillow and the pillow catches on fire right and and the smoke fills the room and the mom comes in right and, you know surprising right and so during that minute and a half sort of you know telling of that story what the listener does, not necessarily, um, you know, vocally, although there are some sort of gasps and other kind of vocalizations, but what that listener does with the face and what that listener does with the body and what that listener does sort of, sort of non-verbally uh, or visually um, steers the conversation in particular directions. And so what she and others have found is, is that sort of that, you, you can't do that if you're distracted, right? They, they have, there's these clusters of behaviors uh, called specific responses, and, and they are both sort of visual and, and vocal. You can hear them and you can see them. They're tied to specific moments in the conversation. You can't just move them around the conversation. A look of surprise when someone says something surprising or a look of sadness when, says, when someone says something that upsets you. And, and when you're distracted, research has found, you, you, that's limited. The specific responses are limited. And in those cases, when you're talking to a distracted listener, you tell less coherent stories, you speak for shorter amounts of time, and you say things like, well, that's all I got to say. There's nothing more to say because you feel like there's nobody there that's giving you the feedback necessary to tell you it's okay to keep going. And so really what listeners do is encourage the extended elaboration of a story whether that story is about a close call or about a distressful event or about something good that has happened or about whatever it is, the listener's primary role in many cases is to continue to tell the speaker in so many words or without words, it's okay to go. It's okay to keep going. Keep going, please. Right. It's, it's, it's furthering and it's, yeah. it's it, right. And it's, and it's harmonic. It's, it's absolutely because, you know, I'm nodding as you're telling a story and my nodding is not, it's affirming the speaker. It's, it's affirming. It's saying it's good. Keep going, please go on. And, you know, in schools, you know, I'm, I'm this, this podcast is, is about relationships in the classroom and the classroom of life. Right. But really it's, it's about how this is um, every guest I've had on the show is, 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 is speaking wisdom that is applicable to, teachers who are working with kids aged three all the way up through, you know, university students. And this idea of having the time to listen. So, I mean, I've seen, and and I've been that teacher who I'm so busy. I'm just the, 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 I've got curriculum to cover and the school day is so fast and the schedule is so rapid. And I I don't, there have been times I'm definitely not present. And in fact, my aim by quote unquote listening would be to be curt and to try to let's get to the bottom of this. Right? Like what are you really asking What's me to issue? do? Yeah. Is that 
That what's the issue? Tell me the issue. What's your problem? Exactly, because it's about me, right? It's not about you who's, who wants to talk about an issue. It, it, it becomes about me because I need to frame your issue into the time space that I feel like I'm allotted. And, and therefore, I'm, I'm clearly not doing active listening the way that you're explaining it. I'm not furthering. I'm not trying to find harmony with the, the person who is speaking with me and who, who is asking for the listening time. And I find that that is so common in schools. So I, I'm wondering if, if um, before we talk about school specifically, is listening a skill, active listening, a skill that you believe is important to teach to young kids? Because you mentioned mindfulness earlier, and mindfulness mm -hmm. is certainly more and more in the U.S., uh, education more and more included in curriculum it ties into listening do you believe that it's possible do you think it's important that we can that we raise a generation of students who have learned how to listen from young age yeah that that term the term listening is, is interesting right everybody has their own sort of idiosyncratic definition of what that term means and, and it and it develops over time i'm reminded of a of a an event that happened when my oldest was in this uh, three-year-old uh, preschool class. It was the monkey class. She was a monkey. Um, and I went to go pick her up, um, and the uh, teacher said something that um, both made me such a proud parent and a curious um, scholar. She said she's such a good listener. And so initially I thought, oh, this is great. I'm going to write this somewhere, you know, put it up on the refrigerator. But then I thought, what does she mean by that? Um, and so we had a conversation later on after, you know, I was, um, you know, done being the proud papa where, where it sort of came to the realization with what that meant was that, you know, she, she stood in line when she was told to stand in line and she, you know, washed her hands when she, you know, so she was obedient. And I think at very early ages, what we think of as good listening is, you know, we turn our listening ears on, we sit still, it's, it's conflated with all these, all these other sort of elements of obedience. Right. And then when we get into sort of, you know, first, second, third, maybe, you know, sort of higher elementary and, and middle school it becomes sort of a combination of obedience and sitting still and make sure you, you know, understand and comprehend everything I'm saying. So it becomes listening comprehension. And there are some some states that actually teach and train and test uh, for listening comprehension. Um, and, and so, and, and that, and that's what it becomes, you know, that's what it is all the way through high school is this notion of, and, and so common core has these listening comprehension objectives. Uh, it's almost like reading comprehension. Can you listen to a 30 minute lecture and, and how much can you regurgitate and remember from that? Um, and it isn't until, you know, college when you might happen to go to a college that happens to have a communication studies program that happens to have a course on listening. Usually it's like, a, a one lesson in an interpersonal communication course or one lesson in a public speaking course. But, but maybe you happen to take a course on listening in college and you realize that, that there, there are these things that I can cultivate that I should have been cultivating from an early age that now I have to catch up on because I'm a terrible support provider. I'm a ter you know, I'm a terrible X, Y, and Z. And I didn't even realize it because no one really told me that it was something that I could actually train myself to do. So, I think we're doing a better job sort of, you know, teaching the whole student with social emotional learning. So there's a lot of these modules and all of these programs and initiatives out there that take seriously other skills like listening. But again, it becomes a part of a module, maybe a module in and of itself, but usually it's part of a larger module on emotional support or on being kind or being considerate or being compassionate and listening is kind of mentioned. Right? or some other term like understanding or responsiveness or some other term that's used in place of listening. So yeah, I think we can do a lot more. And there's some examples um, uh, of some curriculum, some curricula that are out there. Um, uh, there. There's one already in place that's been used in several school districts across the nation um, by uh, a producer director by the name of Aaron Christopher. He's got a movie called Listen, and I sent you some stuff about that. Um, and um, it, it's for older kids and it's emotionally really heavy. It deals with some really heavy sort of teenage, but also adult problems. Um, and really for an hour and 45 minutes of an hour and 48 minute movie, it sort of brings you to this realization that not only are we terrible at showing up for other people, but bullying is so bad that it drives kids to 
cut themselves and to commit suicide. And that if they don't do those things, to at least be depressed and otherwise sort of, you know, not hopeful about their own future. Um, and so what are we doing inside our schools to really sort of highlight that message and lift up the, the need for spaces in schools where, like you said, people can come and actually think through and talk through their issues and not just with the counselor, yeah. right? One counselor for every 200 students or whatever the case might be, right? But, but actually a space where you have like peer counselors and so there's these peer education programs that are out there that are available that you can train a small group of students to then, right, um, hold these kinds of sessions and lessons of mindfulness and, and other kind of listening type skills. Um, so, so long answer to, to a short question, which is, yes, I think we need to do more at younger ages to teach listening as something other than obedience, as something other than comprehension, as something holistic that, that touches on all of these other things that we have, have now decided are important from mindfulness to social emotional learning to emotional intelligence to, right, the list goes on and on. The problem, of course, becomes as soon as this is mandated by the administration, teachers go, right, okay, so this is what I'm supposed to do for this year. Next year, it'll be something else. So I'm not going to really give it all that much attention. And it's forced on me. And you're not really giving me any resource to actually do it well. And so the problem is it doesn't, it's not part of the culture of the school itself. And so we spend a lot of time, I've spent a lot of time in my career and I spent a lot of time with Listen First Project trying to make the point that what we need to do is to cultivate Listen First classrooms, schools, organizations, and really just societies, right? What would it look like to have um, as um, one uh, recent um, philosopher has coined a listening society? What would it mean to actually take seriously markers of well-being alongside of GDP and other markers of economic health to talk about how well we're doing as a society. What if we actually measured those things in schools to say not only we're a, an A school because we have some stupid test that we all took and you know 80% of us you know passed it, but we're doing well emotionally, we're doing well mentally, we're doing well physically. Um, what if we took those things seriously and, and how could listening be part of that sort of shift in mindset and culture within schools to really stress the importance of some of these skills from kindergarten all the way through high school? You know, there's a, there's a scene from the movie, The Breakfast Club, right? Vintage classic teen movie uh, yeah. where Ali Sheedy's character, she's a loner. She's in the back row at the, during the detention. She's wearing the, the, the big puffy coat and she's just by herself and she's like the oddball. Anyhow, finally, Molly Ringwald's character, the princess, kind of goes to her and she's like, what, what, what's the matter with you? Like, what, what, and she's like, and Ali Sheedy's like, it's my parents. And no, this is actually Emilio Estevez. He's like, what's, what's wrong with you? And she, and Ali Sheedy goes, it's my parents. And, and Estevez, the jock, he assumes, he's like, oh, do they hurt you? You know, do, are they, are they mean to you? And her response is, you probably know this, they ignore me. No, they ignore me. Yeah. They ignore me. And to be listened to is to be seen. <laughs> to be listened to is to be acknowledged. You, you matter. And schools, to your point about schools, you know, to, to have a listening focused school environment where, cause so often, right. You just said 200 students to one counselor, like really, like how are you going to be known? Right. Um, in a school with no windows, 2000 students, how are you going to be known? And usually the loud, that's where we have the, in our society, the loud people make it to the top, the loud, you know, be, be, any sort of attention is good attention. Um, cause you raise yourself out, out of the masses. But here we're actually looking at this idea that really what people want instinctively and we're living through this pandemic right now by the way um graham which is you know we are all more lonely and more alone than we typically are as as individuals and i and i'm i'm reading research saying that there's more calls to hotlines there's more uh spike in depression a spike in anxiety people not knowing and not feeling known and feeling very detached yeah. so this idea of listening for connection is so important and I love that you're supportive through your organization listen first as well which we'll talk about in a second you're supportive of this idea of putting active listening as not just an add-on not another initiative for the poor teachers to have to layer on to another year and then forget 
but to actually have it be part of the mission and the ethos of every school. Um, that's, it's critical. And the last thing I'll say that reflects on what you were saying earlier is it sounds like there's a difference you were making between decoding and listening comprehension. And in what listening comprehension doesn't seem to have is reflection. It doesn't seem to have this, like when you're being listened to and, the, and you're listening, you're reflecting on what the person is saying. You're, you're taking the time to reflect. And that is, and like when I was an English teacher, when I would say to a high school student, you're a good listener, it would be because she or he in their answers would reflect on what other students were saying earlier, maybe, right? Would, be, would bring a topic or a concept from something that was a while ago into the conversation again. Like that just proves that that student listened deeply and retained deeply. And that is, to me, that seems like more of an accurate assessment of good listening. I think, sense? I mean, we, we've got all these myths in our society about what listening is and, and, and what it isn't. You know, we, we think listening is agreeing. We think, you know, listening is simply, you know, the passive sort of sound waves hitting, you know, hitting our, our eardrums and being, you know, mulled over. Um, I, I, I talk about the ABCs of listening. So I see listening as sort of a, a three part, um, you know, phenomenon or concept. Um, it's, it's attitudinal, uh, the motivation to listen, the mindset, the preparation, um, sort of the, 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 the ontology, the being of a listener, uh, all these things largely that our conversation has centered primarily on that, that sort of that, that A. Uh, so A is the, is the attitude. B is the behaviors, which are largely a focus of, of that term active listening. I actually try to steer away from using that term because it tends to be attached to very simple and not very helpful lists of like the top five things to do as a listener. Number one, shut your mouth. Number two, ask a question. Number, you know, it's just like, okay, we're going to turn everybody into robots. So <laughs> it's not that are, simple. <laughs> you know, behaviors are important, right? And it's important to know, you know, what to do in response because in fact, research shows that your judge is, is a good or bad listener primarily on your specific verbal responses as opposed to other, you know, components, that, you know, like eye contact and so forth, right? We pay more attention to how someone responds to us verbally. Um, so they're important, but when I train organizations or, or I teach this, I, 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 I teach behaviors last because I think the, the attitude is first. And then the C is the cognitive. That's all the comprehension, understanding, right? There's several steps within there. So each of these attitude, behavior, and cognition, each of those is also a complex set of processes that you need to understand. So with cognition, for instance, there's at least five, if not seven or nine, depending on what model you draw from places where misunderstanding can happen. You can, you can not hear well, you can attach the wrong meaning to, you can, uh, you know, attach the wrong motive to, right? You can do all of these different things that, that can cause misunderstanding. So when, when, when we understand that, I don't know, 95 or 99 or some really high percentage of the, of, of the, of the conversations that we have don't result in really big, meaningful misunderstandings, our mind should be blown given the complexity of what's going on, both from the angle of how I'm producing. I've never said this sentence before in my life, and yet I can speak at 400 words a minute. That, that's just mind blowing to me, right? Equally, you've never heard that sentence before, and yet you immediately comprehend without even thinking about it exactly not only what I said, but what I meant. Yes. And then exactly what I said fades from memory almost as quickly and you're left with this gist of the conversation that you can repeat back to me. Yep. And even though it's not exactly what I said, it's pretty close to what I meant. And so I said, yeah, that's pretty much what I meant. And we do this back and forth, sometimes implicitly, sometimes explicitly, hundreds if not thousands of times a day. And there's only a small portion of those that are problematic. But when they are problematic, Skid. <laughs> they can become really infuriating and problematic for the relationship, yeah. right? So in addition to the ABCs, we also talk about the various outcomes or um, the, the impact of listening. And that impact is both individual and relational as well as societal, right? So there's individual benefits and, and, and consequences for good and bad listening. There's relational benefits and consequences for good and bad listening. And then there's societal benefits and consequences for good and bad listening. And we oftentimes only pay attention to those individual components. It made me feel good. It made her feel better. 
and we and we just ignore the complexity in these multi layers of relationships and societies and groups and and sort of how we can getting back to the original point how can we create more cohesive trusting relationship oriented entities schools classrooms organizations families households by the simple i put that in quotes by the simple act of being there and being present and giving our agenda right sidestepping our agenda and giving our full attention to the person in front of us full attention and, and i say that as someone that is terrible at doing that 100 percent of the time well is there anybody who's perfect i mean I, <laughs> no and, and, and i catch myself with with the people i should be doing it with the most which is my family and i catch myself not doing it because i have to be on all day long right and then where i can release myself in the evenings or whatever then then you know i just think well now i don't have to you know but that's when i should be on that's when i really should be responsive right and so nobody's perfect um and what i tell my students is i'm not going to teach you to be 100 percent you know excellent quality listener or communicator but what i am going to do is i'm going to give you the vocabulary to where you can spot problems and go about trying to mitigate those problems and go about you know fixing and put that in quotes kind of fixing the problems that you do cause when you fail to listen to your fullest potential you know i love that i love that example about just going home to your family and not being the most 100 percent perfect listener i mean we started this conversation by talking about your work being focused on those relationships actually primarily it's the ones that you're your you're most intimate relationships your family your closest friends and how we can be better listeners to them if we could if we could finish this conversation with a little more information about what listen up or listen first is and and what listen first has become and how anybody listening to this conversation to this to this podcast episode or, or watching it can become more aware of what listen first does and consider uh consider it for their school yeah absolutely so um listen first project we're a nonprofit organization um, it was founded by um, Pierce Godwin, who's my kind of partner in crime on uh, kind of the stuff that we do. Um, and I started working with the organization three years ago um, when we when when he was kind of in this identity crisis of what what the organization is going to be. And and what we discovered back then was that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of organizations across the country, and in fact across the, the globe, that um, prioritize and try to um, Sort of teach people how to uh, engage in meaningful conversation, especially across difference. Um, and so, in our increasingly tribal and polarized, particularly politically polarized, um, you know, uh, country, um, we don't just sort of disagree; we distrust and, and demean and despise other people who see the world differently from us. We are ending friendships and relationships. We're spewing hate on social media. Um, you know, we're doing things that aren't in our best interests as, as, a, as a country um, from a big P political to a small P political to a relational um, side of viewpoint. And so we realize that there's all these organizations out there. There weren't very many efforts to try to um, coalesce those organizations under what we're calling a, a coalition uh, or a sustained sort of aggregated um, and aligned social movement. So we started three years ago with four organizations in what we call the Listen First Coalition. Now is 300 organizations um, strong that power the society-facing initiative called National Conversation Project. Um, right now, during COVID, we are spearheading the campaign called Weaving Community with David Brooks's Weave Social Fabric Project. Um, it's a collaborative effort with the 300 partner organizations in National Conversation Project, Listen First Coalition, and the WEAVE Project. And that project is all about the importance of relationships and building community, uh, acts of caring and connection that um, uh, allow us to see our common humanity as opposed to our sort of differences. So, so I think, I think, um, I think we, sorry to interrupt, but I'm just thinking about that because that, that's David Brooks mentions and focuses on it in his, his recent book, the second mountain. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm pretty sure we've is the organization that, that started with, uh, this person who just started inviting people over to her dinner table. Uh, she'd open her house to 
really strangers and, and use the dinner table as a way to bring people together. And then it just kind of took off from there as this organization um, that, that brings people together. So, yeah. So like weave is very much like what we try to do. They, they we try to just, just um, identify all of the many efforts around the country and around the world that are trying to either in our language sort of listen first to understand and then weave language, weave stronger communities and stronger relationships. Um, and so both of these organizations are more kind of coalition, um, kind of, you know, high level. Um, what are, what are all the opportunities that people have in their local communities and across the country for more sort of collective communities to interact with people that you wouldn't normally interact with, right? So in the school setting, we have various partners that um, do this across political divides or across urban rural divides. So, um, you know, there's, um, there's many schools that, that sit in urban locations and also many schools that sit in more rural um, locations. And so there's some organizations that try to, on the internet, sort of, you know, get urban students and rural students to have conversations with each other. Um, so whatever the divide is, whatever the difference is, whatever the marker of sort of us versus them, and, and we're, we're trying to, to weave a, a collective we um, out, out of that whole process. Um, so we largely work in society as kind of a social movement. Research suggests that 100 million Americans want a national campaign to stem the rising um, uh, rancor and deepening division in the country. We position Listen First Project as that campaign and the current Weaving Community Initiative as the campaign specific to the COVID crisis. Um, in schools, we have chapters across the country in high schools and colleges that convene different kinds of meetings and different kinds of initiatives from mindfulness yoga in the morning to Sort of, you know, debates in the and not in the classic kind of argue who and, and try to win debate, but sort of the ethical debate where you try to get at truth and you try to sort of understand that these different perspectives might be little different lenses of truth and perspective. Um, and and we do that in libraries mainly at schools. Library is kind of the location where a lot of that stuff happens, but speech and debate clubs can be instrumental in collecting students around that um, central mission. Um, and, and then we also are in the workplace. So I um, am a certified practitioner for an instrument called the Echo Listening Profile um, that works to help teams become more productive by understanding their own proclivities to sort of bad habits of listening um, and to understand that we all listen to and for different kinds of information. So it's when you go to a meeting and you leave and you realize the eight people in the meeting just went to eight different meetings. Like what does that mean for productivity in the workplace? But we've also done some of that stuff in schools and I do it in my own classroom when I assign students to groups for group projects. We, we talk about how they each individually listen and what the strengths and weaknesses they bring to those listening moments. Um, so all of these things are in the service of sort of raising the awareness of the importance of listening and conversation, especially across divides but particularly for sort of individual, relational, and societal health and well-being. Dr. Graham Bodie, just so honored to have you on the show today and to talk about listening, to listen to you talk about listening. Um, I hope I did an okay job. I'll see you oh, in, the, in the tape. <laughs> and uh, just thank you very, very much for your time. And, and I, just, I just really value all your insights. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you for the time. You've been listening to Reach Teach Talk with Nat Damon. If you'd like to recommend a guest for a future episode, you can send your suggestion or questions to nat at reachacademics.com.